Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Nalani Belaramani, who is interviewing here from uh, UT Austin. Uh, her advisor is Mike Dalin. She's done work in a number of different areas in distributed systems, but her thesis work has concentrated on distributed storage systems, which is what she'll be telling us about today. Hi. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Nalani Belaramani, and I'm here to talk about my work in storage systems. So data plays a very important role in our lives. We have it almost everywhere, in our laptops, in our mobile devices, they're on servers in the computer, they're on enterprise servers. You know, the importance of data cannot be, I was just talking to uh, JD about, you know, backups and stuff. Um, and I just lost my data recently, and it's, it's, it's a pain when you lose data. So it becomes important that for data storage systems to give us certain guarantees, we want them to be we want our data to be durable. So if we store data there, we should be able to access it at any time. We want it to be available so that we can, you know, if when I want to use it, I can use it and give us good performance so we can get to it quickly. A common technique which has been used recently is replication. You make copies of data and store it on different machines. And that helps durability because there's an extra copy which if it fails, you can access the other one. And it also helps performance because you can access the closest copy to you. Now, replication is not a new solution. And I'm not saying I did this. It's been done for years. In fact, we've had so many systems over the past years using replication as a technique to, for data storage systems. Now, this is only a subset of the systems which have been published. And there are a lot more out there. The thing to notice is that even though we spent 20 years on this, the new systems are still being developed. And the question to ask is why? I mean, haven't we beaten this to the grave? The reason is um, every storage system needs to make this fundamental trade-offs between consistency, availability, and partition resilience. You cannot have all three properties. Uh, it's been proven. You can only have two in your system. So each of these existing systems depending on their workloads or their goals. They fit into a different point in this design, in these trade-offs. And so when you actually have new technologies or new workloads, you kind of move your trade-offs a little bit. And I mean, they require new trade-offs. And so what you do is you build new systems. Now, the problem is building a new system takes time. You spend months and years to build a system. You spend a lot of your effort on a lot of re-engineering the wheel. You're building the storage, you know, how data is stored from scratch, how to maintain bookkeeping, your, how to transfer updates. And you know, instead of spending on the higher level goals, your efforts being spent on re-implementing all these, all these little things again. Uh, why don't we modify an existing system? The problem is many existing systems uh, their, their implementation is very much related to their original design and their trade-offs. So if they, tra yes? I mean, Coda has, I think, seven PhD theses in it. So yes. clearly it's been modified with new functionality. For, for 10 years, yes, yes, it's been. So is that really true that not been modified for new functionality? No, I think it, it has been true. For, but the thing is, every modification takes such a long time. That's why, it's, that's why it's a PhD thesis. <laughs> exactly. It's, it takes ages to modify them because every time you have, to, if you want to add a new feature, you have to modify a whole bunch of code. And it's, you know, it makes your life difficult. Why can't we just make this process easier? Like, is there a way in which I can build a system easily? And this is what I want to do, you know. Um, so when we were thinking about this problem, we thought, how about we use a microkernel approach? We have the basic mechanisms. I mean, basic mechanisms of storage, consistency, bookkeeping. And if we have a good set of mechanisms, every system can be developed by implementing as, implementing as different policies over these mechanisms. So that will make our life easier. And we had this approach. I went to Professor Dalin and told him 
hey, I think I know we can make how to make systems e how to build systems easily. He's like, all right, why don't you build ten systems for me? <laughs> Otherwise, you don't graduate. And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> I knew, I, I knew what should go in the mechanisms, but I had no idea how to specify policy. Like, how do we actually build these systems on that? I'm like, how about three? He's like, uh-uh. You know, and I thought I wouldn't graduate. I thought I'd be 45 years old and still working, and I'd see my children graduate. And yeah, let's not get there. <laughs> yes, but then he would still have a beard. <laughs> um, so I look, went back, and I looked at all the policies re looked at all the systems and I figured out a way which we can specify policy easily. And that is what this talk is about. It's how to make pol policy specifications of, this, of systems easily. And thankfully, it worked. And instead of 10, I gave them 12. And these systems put, uh, fit into a wide range of, uh, in different parts of the design space and they cover different consistency semantics, how updates are propagated. And the cherry on the ice cream is that we did all of them in less than 100 lines of code. Now, you're probably wondering how we did this. And don't worry, the next 20, 40 minutes, you're going to find out all about this. So um, now how do you evaluate the merit of this work? Um, good research has always been categorized as being either haiku or judo. Haiku is a Japanese form of poetry which emphasizes on elegance in its small form, having compact and small primitives which make it, uh, which make it easier to develop systems. And judo is, you know, in Japanese martial arts form. So for a lay person to, it's very difficult to appreciate haiku because you may not be able to appreciate the elegance. But if you meet a person, in a, a judo master in a, bar uh, in a bar, you very quickly know he's a master once you get into a fight with him. So this work, again, has both aspects of haiku and judo. We have identified this, we've distilled, we've identified this small set of primitive, which distill all these abst abstractions of distributed computing system. It may be difficult to appreciate at first go, but we took these primitives and actually implemented 12 diverse systems, and that's where our judo comes in. So in the next part of, in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to first talk about the two key ideas which went into our, how, into making the policy specification easy. And then I'm going to talk about our policy infrastructure, our framework, which makes it easy, over which you can build the systems. And the last part is uh, how we actually went about building them or the evaluation of the systems we built on those. So the first key idea is the microkernel approach. Uh, we have these mechanisms. They do grunt work for you. And the policy is where the design is. Um, and that would make, so the next part, the, the next big question is, how can we make policy specification easy? Um, if you look at uh, the systems, the multitudes of systems. And if you take a step back and look beyond their technical details or their, op or their optimizations, you realize that they're actually trying to answer three major questions. One is, where is the data stored? Uh, second, how are updates or information propagated among these nodes? And the third is, what is the consistency or durability requirements you want? So the first two questions actually boil down to routing. Uh, it's just how data moves around these nodes. Uh, the second one is just blocking. Basically, you block access to data until, safe, until these, these, these semantics are guaranteed. So let's have a look at routing. So if you, we took a couple of systems and you compare. So Bayou, for example, sets up peer-to-peer -peer connections to transfer updates. Chain replication moves updates through a chain. Coda is a client server system, and so most of the information transfer occurs along client server lines. Tierster uses a hierarchical tree-based system to propagate updates. 
So essentially, that's what you're doing. You're just setting up when, which node, and what data, and how data flows through the system. It's just routing. The second in the thing is blocking. So if you look at consistency, what consistency tries to do is try, you try to answer the question, which version of data I can access. So if I want to access only valid data, and my local version is old or it's invalid, all I, can, all I have to do is just block until I can get valid data. Or for, dur for some systems, they have a stronger durability requirement in which, for example, in a client service system, you want to make sure that a write is on a server before it's considered complete. So when I issue the write, before I return, I need to block until I know for sure that it's in the server. And just having blocking and routing is actually sufficient to do a lot of policy specification. Yes? So does, uh, does when an operation is blocked on something, can that convey some kind of priority to the system about the relative importance of that operation? Or say that write being made persistent as opposed to some other write? Or is that not a a relevant aspect of these systems that you're trying to capture? Is it not something that they did? Something like if I had so, multiple operations, so, which one I would... Uh, from what I understand, your question, I'm rephrasing, is uh, if for those systems, if they did a write, they, had a di they differentiated between writes which were blocked and which couldn't be blocked. Is that what you're trying to ask? I guess I was just asking, if you have multiple operations, mm -hmm. do you, is there ever a need to um, convey some kind of uh, priority between the operations, which ones you would like to complete sooner? Do any of these other, of these 12 systems that you've re-implemented, did they do that in their original implementation? Is that important? And is that something that's going to be captured in the new implementation? I can't remember. We have a scheme of doing, uh, of implementing priorities. You can tell this operation needs to be prioritized or prioritized over the other operation. Um, but I'm not sure if the other, I can't remember right now uh, if they did that. I know our implementations didn't. And so I'm guessing they didn't either. Because we tried to follow as close as we could to, to their implementation. But there is worth in prioritizing. So as, as we said that, you know, if I do have a block, uh, a write, an operation which is blocked, I need to count on routing to actually make sure that I get the data so that I can unblock. So in some sense, um, route, you know, blocking guarantees the safety of the system and makes sure that you're not doing anything unsafe, whereas routing helps to enforce the liveness of the system, where you're making sure the system unblocks and makes progress. So system development basically can be reduced to mechanism, if we separate mechanism, which does the grunt work, and we have policy. And the policy in our infrastructure is divided into routing and blocking. And separating the policy gives us a very clean, structured approach to designing your system. Or, and it gives you a separation of concerns. And because they're so different, we can actually have special programmatic abstractions for each one of them, so you, we can make implementation easy, easier. Yes? So this, this approach seems you know, very elegant, very clean, and I'm wondering if you're, if you're losing anything in the translation. I mean, so you say, oh, in you know, 100 lines of code or less, we can basically use this framework mm -hmm. and then get all these different semantics and different file systems. Yes. But I'm wondering, I mean, is it really that easy, or are there certain aspects of a file system that you're not exactly emulating? I'm just wondering if, you know, at some point in the talk, they'll say something like, uh, Okay, well, I was able to do, let's say, Farsight, 50 lines of code. But mm -hmm. there was some weird feature that I couldn't really you know, implement in my framework because, as it turns out, there's some. Well, know, we haven't actually come possible. across that feature yet. It would be great to come across a feature like that so we could actually make changes and figure out where, our, where this fails. Okay, so in other words, you're saying that for all of the 12 systems you looked at, you're yeah. able to completely you know, emulate the semantics yes. of that system. Yes. So this is our, so I'm going to talk about our policy architecture, which actually takes these two of these approaches and realizes it and gives you a clean API over which you can actually develop, make, make, make it easy to develop policy. 
So the first part of, our, uh, of the system is, of course, sorry, coming in. So we have a layer of mechanisms and um, the policy API, that's what it provides you with. And what programmers or system designers do is specify routing policy and blocking policy over this API. I'll follow up with a question here. Um, so you said that you have uh, implemented 12 file systems mm -hmm. and you've met all the specifications for your site. Yes. How do you know that? Because um, most of the papers are reading, you know, I can't figure out what they're doing anything. I understand. We have faithfully emulated that. Um. <laughs> So uh, we tried to look at uh, the basic techniques. So they have callbacks, leases. We, we try to stick to what they are, what they did. Um, we, I mean, it takes, we had to study each of these systems to figure out exactly what they're doing and how to map it into our world. Um, we may not have done the smaller optimizations which they've used, but uh, our, from what we evaluated are over, I mean, the, how the consistency semantics are guarantee, how they propagate updates among their nodes, and uh, the availability of data is, is we try and match them as much as, uh, we've matched them as much as we can. So I could go into the details of the implementations later for one of them if you want offline. So, so just one quick question. Mm -hmm. so how about replication policies? Things like how many replicas you store, where you store them? Like, is this part of routing or? That's part of routing. Okay. So, I mean, we give you a general framework and you choose what you want. If you want five replicas or you store that, if you want 10 replicas, you specify it in routing. So the part is, how do we actually specify routing? How can we make it easy to, for you to say that I want 10 replicas or I want three replicas? Um, yes. Let me just follow up on, mm -hmm. on the question. So there's, there's really a, a, uh, a verification issue here. Yes. Right. And, you know, how do you how do you validate your implementation against these other file systems? To be sure that you know it might look the same from ten thousand feet, but did mm -hmm. you actually get it right? You know, and the, the prioritization issue aside, and possibly some others. Yeah. You know, how, how do you know? You know when, we, when we write simulators, yeah. You know, are you off in La La Land or are you spot on? It's really hard to know. So we tried to do a comparison, sort of of their model and our model. But how do you exactly know? We could probably only tell that if we model check their implementation and our implementation. Um, I don't know any implementation which has been model checked. And our implementation, we are working on. One of the next things to do is actually model check the implementation, that being able to. Were you able to reproduce results in, in some of the papers? Or the, we were. We, we, we saw. Similar, there are the error bounds. I mean, I'm just. We were able to. To get the general trends of their of their papers, we redid some of the experiments, and uh, the trends we saw. Since we can't we can't match with their exact numbers, but the trends were, the overheads uh, were were in the same ballpark. Okay, great. So, um, for the layer of mechanisms, we actually use uh, practi. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, that. Sorry for. Uh, this part, my work basically focused on the policy API and how to specify routing and policy. And the mechanisms were joint work with a couple of colleagues. Um, so the mechanisms, what you need is a flexible mechanism layer which can fit into, which can help you build all the various systems. And so we use Practi for that. Uh, Practi, you know, can be used for uh, Exposes new design points in the middle because it supports um, a three, you know, supports a lot of the design space, and it takes care of all the bookkeeping, the storage, um, the local read-write operations for you, and so you don't really need to worry about that. For this talk, we're not going to go into the details of Practi because it's very technical and would take too much time. But one thing, what you need to know is Practi gives us a great information exchange. Uh, primitive, which is called subscriptions. What subscriptions do is it allows one node to exchange up updates with another node. And you can choose what subset of data you're interested in. And uh, uh, if whether you want to transfer just the whole updates or you just want notifications. So in, in the practice world, they call it bodies and invalidation. The thing to note is when you actually have a subscription established between two nodes, any update which the source node sees it will forward it to the destination node, or you know, and if 
you know, so as it's a way of getting notifications. <coughs> so the next part of the talk is uh, policy. So using these mechanisms and this basic primitives Practi gives us, how can we specify policy? So as I mentioned, routing is just making sure data propagates. And what that boils down to is you're using, uh, you're establishing subscriptions between different nodes um, according to your system design. And now the key thing for us to do next is to have a clean and simple API which makes it easier to uh, set up subscriptions. And the second thing is perhaps we've, we've actually used a domain-specific language to help you make it, give you a concise uh, routing policy. Yes? Was the development of the policy engine in tandem with Practi, or uh, was Practi ever modified in the process of developing the policy, uh, policy language and specification? So was it that you had these mechanisms and you found them suitable to implement all your policies, or as you're implementing your policies, do they require changes to the mechanisms to put them in Practi? Uh, we required, uh, for of some of the systems, we required uh, changes to the policy, I mean, to the mechanisms. So, but then at the end of it, when we started, we started with one or two systems, and we realized there were some parts of Practi which weren't sufficient, and we added those mechanisms. And as we went along, we were at the, towards, the, towards the last few systems we implemented, we, the Practi mechanisms didn't need any changes. How large is Practi? Uh, 30,000 lines of code. All right, so, so the clean and simple API we have is actually just nine up calls from the mechanisms and seven down calls. Now what you're trying to do for routing is basically try and um, set up subscriptions based on the information you get from the mechanism. So for example, if a local read was blocked or if a connection was established, if I got a certain message, and based on that you try and tell the mechanisms to establish subscriptions or remove them or just send a single update. And with this set of like 20 methods, we were able to implement all the various systems. Yes? Did you implement weekly connected operation in Coda? Sorry, come again? Did you implement weekly connected operation in Coda? Yes. Yes, we did. And so to specify routing, it basically boils down to you get these events, you call the actions. So it's an event-based uh, development platform. Um, and it's routing. So we realized, why don't we just use a language which is actually meant for routing? So there's a language called Overlog, which is developed by Berkeley, Intel Berkeley, which, uses, uh, which is used to set up network overlays. And we took that language and we modified it a little bit to fit our, our needs. And um, we were, and it's based on a, its main abstractions are tables and rules and events. So whenever an event occurs, it fires a set of rules, which might, uh, which might in turn call actions, I mean, call the down calls or fire other rules. Uh, the advantage of using a network and overlay language is, a network overlay language is, you can actually have policy events based on uh, network connections. So say if I detect a peer, I should establish a subscription to it to get an updates. And so it makes it easy to it, make policy based on network events or just local mechanism events. Just to give you a taste of what this uh, language looks like, uh, let's say we have this simple rule we want to do is if a local read is blocked, uh, I establish subscriptions from the server to me, so I can get the so I can get the data and I can unblock. Now, this is what Overlog looks like. Um, it, you should read it from left to right. What it looks like, <laughs> it's, it takes some getting used to, but it's actually eventually it makes it easy to write. Um, so you might get this triggering event, which will tell you that all right, this operation's blocked. Um, the at sign at at C is the location. So this is just telling you this is at the client or it's, it's a placeholder for your local node. It has tables so you can do a table lookup and you can set up conditions and assignments and, and you know, based on that you can generate another resulting event. And in this case the resulting event ends up to be one of our down calls and it, it will call the system to set up, this, set up the, the subscription. 
and that's taken care of by the mechanisms. So, you know, yes, it takes a little getting used to, but it actually leads to very uh, concise code, which greatly which follows the pseudocode very closely. So um, the next comes to uh, blocking. Um, now, as we mentioned, blocking comes, you block access to data as long as to guarantee safety. And what is the best place to block other than, you know, you just block before and after you access data so that to make sure that before you do the access or after you do the access, the semantics are guaranteed. So PADS gives us five blocking points, which are at the access interface. And what the system designer's job is to specify when they can unblock or when they should go through. So um, for that, we actually give you five predefined, I'm uh, sorry, four built-in conditions which you can use to specify these blocking points. And there's a one extensible condition, which is the L message, uh, for if you want to communicate with the routing layer. So for example, I'm going down to the bottom one is, if I want to, when I do a local write and I want to make sure that it's at the server, you know, I can, I can block after I've done the write and wait for the routing to take care of detecting that it's reached the server and the server sends an, act, an acknowledgement back to me and that can help me unblock uh, this write and it will return. Or say if I only want to read valid data, then I just block a read until my local data is valid. And with these conditions, we've actually been able to implement a wide range of consistent semantics. Yes? Is the server also built using this language? Yes. Can you specify um, how metadata flows or only data? You can specify metadata. So the metadata in uh, the subscriptions we actually have, we separate it into metadata and data. So in the invalidations are metadata and the updates are data. Sorry, data is updates and bodies. Sorry, actually metadata the files. For example, can you control the, the file is not just data, but also yes. the data. Bits and mm -hmm. things like that. So does that also flow over to this language? Um, so the this can so the basic we we actually limited by our mechanisms. So our me in our mechanisms, uh, an object a data is stored as a single object. So you can always have an object to file mapping in which you can have one object storing metadata and the other object storing uh, the actual data of the file. And so you can set up routing uh, subscriptions based on just metadata as well. So you, because you can choose what data set you want to propagate through on a subscription. Okay, so, so where is that mapping done? Like if you wanted to get, let's say, POSIX semantics, mm -hmm. then it sounds like you'd have to set up the subscription <coughs> for all the metadata and the subscription for the data, as you're saying. So what, is that done in this language, or is that done? It's, um, it's done in, so what, you would have, what that would entail is you have a library function which converts from POSIX to the object IDs, and how it's routed is done in this language. Okay. And have, you, have you pulled the threads from all the way through? Maybe, maybe I'm skipping to the end of the talk, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. how real this is. If, in other words, were you able to actually build a complete sort of POSIX compliant file system that you could then do things like you know, run make on and that kind of thing? We, had a, we have an NFS interface over the object interface, and we were able to do reads, writes, and run make as well okay. uh, for some of them. Yeah, we did an Andrew benchmark on, on some systems, but I don't have the data with me right now. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Basically, you know, what I said, so if we have sound mechanisms and we use declarative way of specifying policy, we should be able to specify storage very quickly, right? And a proof of this is this is just the code of an actual system we implemented. It's tier store, and since we implemented it on pads, we call it P tier store. And I don't expect you to be able to read this. But <laughs> the point of, because it's all in overlog and it's too small. But the point is, is that you can have an actual system running um, on a single page. And it, with all the recovery mechanisms, handling failures, and you know, just getting, getting things right. And, being, and we've actually deployed it on certain machines and have it run. And it's just a single page. You know? So it makes development easy. It makes it easy to do code review. It makes it easy to change features if you want to. And that's where our, our power lies. So we go on, how do we evaluate us? How do we evaluate an approach? I mean, there usually is no 
yes, I can tell you it makes things easier. I can build one system and tell you, look, I built this in two weeks. Uh, but there really is no quantitative way of saying this method is easier than the other method. So we base our evaluation on experience. Instead of just building one system, we built 12. Um, we picked them from different parts of the design <coughs> space. Um, and I must say that these are not you know, bug compatible versions. Uh, you know, they're not exactly the same. But we've captured most of the consistency, availability, performance trade-offs they've made. And um, so, you know, let's have a look at what we've done. Can I jump in with a question? Yes. If I'm jumping to you at the end of your talk, please mm -hmm. defer me. Yes. So you've got a very nice meta language here for specifying you know, higher level semantics mm -hmm. of your file system. Did you think about going one level up in abstraction and building, in some sense, a conflict graph that could encapsulate the space of, of possible file systems? You know, some of these different file systems are going to have features or, or yeah. primitives or, or uh, policies that are not compatible. Others you may be able to mix and match. But yes. it seems like you could create a graph of the space of legal file systems of which these would be a point uh, and mm -hmm. then automatically synthesize new file systems and maybe even dynamically adapt that, to those or... That would be a great thing to have, but... I don't think we have that. I also think there might be, uh, as trade-offs change, uh, I've new technologies. So before we would have mostly connected infrastructure and we move on to delay tolerant networks. There may be some, if you just have a pre-existing techniques, they may not be sufficient for um, new environments. So you know, just generating, if we have a really intelligent way, if we could use the uh, AI team to help us do that, that would be great. But right. uh, we don't have, you're not there yet. Have you discussed it internally? Uh, no, we haven't. Because okay. for us, it's just making it, I guess that's the next step we do. We have discussed about having a comp an adaptive, uh, adaptive file system which adapts to your workloads and your network. But we haven't discussed in having something generate uh, a generation of a file system. So uh, we picked systems, uh, the 12 systems we built have been picked from uh, various uh, parts of the design space. And the one with the asterisks are basically we took an existing system, uh, our implementation of an existing system, and we modified it for new, for new workloads. And I'll get into a few of them a little later. And each of these systems actually cover a lot of features. They have, we've implemented leases, I mean basic replication techniques including leases, uh, cooperative caching, callbacks, and we've tried to cover as much of the common techniques we can uh, to show that this framework actually is flexible. Was it easy to build? We, each of these systems actually, because we had a concise domain specific language, we could write them in less than 100 routing rules. And since consistency was just blocking in which you specify conditions, each of them were done in less than five or six uh, conditions to implement. And Sorry, yes, what the, asterisks? Uh, the asterisks are we took an existing system, Bayou, for example, and we modified it to suit to a different environment. Uh, I'm going to talk about Bayou and Coda in the next slide. If uh, if you just were a minute. So what the asterisk means is basically were, were the systems easy once? Sorry. Yes, sorry. Can you comment a little bit? Why some of them has like a 70 rules, some of them has like a, a 9 or 6, and uh, what are the major difference? Uh, is that uh, because I'm, I'm so, not familiar with this, but so, I uh, see the complexity so of the, the range of uh, systems. The systems is huge. So. What Bayou does, so comparing, let's compare Bayou and Pangea, for example. So Bayou is just nine rules. What it does is it keeps, so the rules are not only for the data routing, uh, specifying out how data, but it also is the network management rules. So in Bayou, what it does, it keeps track of what peers you have, and it randomly connects to a peer to exchange data. What Pangea does is it actually keeps, uh, it has a notion of goal nodes. You have, it's a completely connected graph. So for each object, you have a set of three goal nodes, 
which are always permanent. And from there, you go on to uh, talk about, um, from there, you make graphs to other non goal nodes, or bronze nodes, they call it. And if one goal node fails, you reestablish another goal node. And so just maintaining that graph complexity. So once you have that graph complexity, just like, propagating updates is simple. You just set up subscriptions. So the 75 lines come from maintaining that, maintaining that graphs. Are all these systems open source? How do you know the, like, uh, the original system? Oh, the original lines of code for, or? So, so they are all open source. You, but basically I'm saying, how do you understand to say, like this is Pangea? Uh, Pan oh, we looked at their papers and we read the their papers. papers and oh. most of them were read by their papers. I see. Right. So now coming to uh, some of the systems, like for example, Bayou, its basic underlying mechanism assumes full replication because it's, it's a server to server exchange, server based protocol, or servers talking to other servers. But now if I wanted to use that same protocol to sync up with my laptop, it will just send me the whole volume of data instead of just one directory or this one my subset of data which I care about. And so it can't really work in cases of partial replication. So what we did is we added small device support in which you know when, when a small device is exchanging updates with a server, it can just specify the data it cares about. And it fits into a different part of the design space. And that took just a change of four rules. Coda on the other hand, is a client service system in which it restricts the communication for clients so that it can only talk to a server. And it can't take advantage of nearby peers to retrieve data. Um, you know, if we wanted to add cooperative caching to it, we just had to change 13 rules, uh, sorry, add 13 rules, basically keeping some um, network tracking of whether peers are available or not. And when I need a data, get it from a peer. And with that, we were able to sort of adapt Coda to support a new workload. Or, yes? So when Coda was designed, the, the designers made some assumptions about how the pieces fit together to make, to make the system safe. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, you, one of the reasons you go to the server is to get a lease to make sure you're actually allowed to, to, access. to read that data. Yes. Um, how do you know when you add these additional rules that you aren't violating some global constraint? Like, is, is, there, is, it, is, there, is it a property of the declarative rule set that you, you can't make any, you can't make things any less correct by adding rules, or did you, or do you have to reason carefully about the whole system every time you make you mutate the rule set? Uh, no, actually, the safety is like once you have your blocking policy right, you have the conditions right. No matter what you do to the rules, it will not let you access so safe data. So in this, so in this case, what we do is we actually separate metadata from data, so you can get the lease from the server. But the actual big chunk of data, you can get it from the, from the client. Yes? Is there some question how the servers uh, use this language? So in Coda, after when a callback, when a write hits mm -hmm. the server, then it invalidates all the callbacks to all the clients before yes. getting that write. Mm -hmm. Is that, so you've written the Coda, it's Coda yeah. server as well? With, 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 uh, with so all the So is there a separate set of policies that are distinct for the servers? Yes. And we include that in our account. So, um, so we did actually a head-to-head -head comparison of Coda with our implementation. Um, we did in different workloads reads and writes for small objects and big and and large objects. A cold read um, corresponds to a read when a client does a read and the object's not locally available, and so it can get the object. It will has to it has to contact the server to get the object. Um, a hot read is when the object's locally available. Connected write is when I do a write and I'm connected to the server and the server needs to break callbacks with the other clients. And a disconnected write is when I'm disconnected from the server. Well, most of them, um, we are pretty close, but for some of them we aren't. And we have some theories about why, we have some modeling about why we're so bad. But in general, we could say that our prototype is actually, uh, its performance is decent for prototyping purposes and for testing out new ideas. And if it works for you, you could still use it. But if you need better performance, we may need to fine tune it a little more. So, Question. yes. So, 
Like, uh, anybody presents mm -hmm. a system saying, I have a generic mechanism, you can uh -huh. write a policy, then the general question in my mind is, uh, if I write a system like GFS, right, I really care about the performance, I really care mm -hmm. about scale, there must be a lot of things like, uh, like a tune for making GFS working. Yes. Then in, in your design, did you believe or do you think you can support uh, saying you can allow people to write a GFS on your system and mm -hmm. uh, the performance will be acceptable by Google? So, uh, is there any fundamental reasons you, you don't think you'll be there? It's just uh, for different purpose. It's, it's, I, I understand. So, there's, uh, I would say our, our prototype has, so it is a Java based prototype. We haven't had spent the engineering effort to make it completely optimized. Um, and I, I'm sure if we did, we could make the, if the mechanism layer was very optimized, we could, be, we could come up to the performance through GFS. But the advantage of actually having this prototype is not the raw performance, but having be able to pick the right design for your system. So the fact that you can modify the rules or implement rules easily, you can try out one design and you know, put, the performance, put the prototype in there. The, Performance isn't that bad for the mean, you know, for trying it out. See if those, that design you had, if that really works or not for your system. And, and if it doesn't, you can actually tweak the design, refine it until you get to the final design you want, and then you spend your optimizing effort. Once you have the perfect policy, policy. and you're, you're, you're happy with the policy, mm -hmm. uh, and then if you decided to throw away your beautiful abstractions, Mm -hmm. and just blast down to as close to the bare metal as you could. Yeah. I think that's, you know, that's, that what would be you're asking, you know, uh, how much of a tax are you paying to maintain your, your high-level APIs? Because in some systems, I would imagine it could be almost zero tax, and in other systems, it's actually really significant. So if we're, if we were to opt, optimize to the bare metal, the mechanisms, I, the API is, it doesn't put any tax over it. Okay. Tax free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it comes free. Uh, this one first. Have you looked at ways of actually compile down your abstractions once you, you can play around it mm -hmm. um, and you find the right way of your routing and everything? Yeah. Is it a way to then go to the bare metal, take, just get rid of your abstraction and, and, and all these boundaries of? modularities okay. and achieve better performance. So you would, are currently, when you write in, in Rovolog, we actually translate it into Java. So it actually, and the mechanisms are in Java. Um, you would, I, I do believe that these boundaries are, are, it's just a simple boundary on how you should establish subscriptions. And if it's, that's a class in your bare metal, that's what we're calling. So I think that this, you could, if you try to get rid of the boundaries, I don't think there are much boundaries to get rid of in this case. Can we I could, ask a follow up? Do you think the performance is because of prototype, because of using Java, or because of modularity? I think it's because of the prototype and the Java, not because of the modularity. Wait. Yes. Actually, you should finish this slide. I'll ask my question later. <laughs> All right. So um, this basically summarizes my work. We've tried to do distill system design into small little primitives with which you can build 12 diverse systems. And uh, I mean, with, with which you can build uh, systems. And uh, we have a policy architecture with this clean, clean API where you can, you can test out different policies. And using that policy architecture, we've actually built 12 diverse systems. And that's what my work is. Go on to the future direction snakes, if that's OK. With. So oh, um, yes. So before we leave this, you mentioned that you had to add a couple of mechanisms uh -huh. uh, as you went along. So could you briefly tell us what? So one of the mechanisms we had to add was uh, being able to store routing information persistently. So for example, in Pangea, uh, they store for every object stores the location of the goal nodes. Uh, you know, so when you get a directory object, you know where the goal node of that of the file is, so that you can contact that uh, the goal node. And 
initially we thought routing can be completely separate from data, but we realized that that's not the case. So we had to put a link towards it so you could actually store um, the locations along with the, with the file object. Like basically when I do a read of an object, it sends, it sends using routing to read locally stored objects so that I can get the configuration information or location to route data. Yeah. Um, um, one, one question I have is, are there mechanisms that you have in the, in, in, in the lower layer that mm -hmm. are kind of specifically used only by one or very few systems? Like basically, I, like one, one idea yeah. I had is, I, of course I could go ahead and implement uh -huh. all these 12 systems, call them mechanisms, and then specify a policy language that just you just know, picks one, one or two, right? yes. <laughs> pick one, pick two. You know. But then, so, so, so the question is, how much then, use uh, is there between the different systems and the, uh, There's a lot of reuse between the systems. Uh, or or uh, framing it down, are there other mechanisms that, that are used only by, say, one, one of these systems? Think about this. Or a few, or I, I, I don't think so, actually, because our basic mechanism is um, you transfer updates, and that's just one primitive, and that's used by everybody. If you boil down to there isn't, yeah, there isn't anything which is just used by one. And having that one policy defeats our purpose of helping you build a new system. Yeah. You know, that's what we want to do. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm there's, there's a fine line here, right? Yeah. How much you push down, you know, everything, you, yeah. You can always make your policy investigation simple if you just push everything Think down. down. Yeah. No, we tried to push down what we could, but not everything. It's flexible enough to build new systems. Yes. So perhaps in the way thing, so how difficult was it to debug that underlying um, mechanism engine? Because you can imagine there being this huge mm -hmm. cross product of the policies that everyone can specify and it can just be a nightmare and so you add a new system and you have to, you know, traces of different code paths within it. Or was it fairly easy to debug it because there was so much sharing amongst the sort of higher level um, primitive? Um, we actually, the mechanisms uh, were they're actually a pretty complicated bunch. And so they were, they were implemented separately from the policies. So in fact, we actually implemented the mechanisms first before we came up with a policy architecture. The story was we had the mechanisms and we didn't know how to build on it. Um, so it wasn't made in mind with a specific policy. It was, so just debugging the mechanisms were independent of all whatever system we wanted to build. So it wasn't, so any, any changes we made, again, was just restricted within the mechanism layer. So we, yeah. Is there anything about security policies, authentication and encryption for these different policies? Uh, not right now. That hasn't been the focus of my work. But there's a colleague of mine who's looking into security and, and malicious nodes. Okay. I was thinking about malicious, just the basic, basic security policies of the malicious file systems take up a large chunk of the code. Right? So it's yeah. thought about. No, our current, our current implementation doesn't support that. Okay. I, and I can imagine that extending out as another, maybe a declarative way. I haven't given it much thought, but I can imagine that. Yes? Uh, I think uh, the, the model of uh, long keep, uh, you provide mechanism. If I use your mechanism, I can just play with my policy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, run and uh, test it. So actually, I was uh, following up with the James question. So basically, uh, it, it make a debugging really hard, right? If, I, if, I, if I'm a user of your mechanism, I'm coming up with some policies. How yeah. can I tell it's my policy's bug or it's my mechanism bug? And uh, if I have the debugger system, and uh, then that mm -hmm. means I pretty much have to understand your mechanism. That makes to this uh, advantage of, oh, this is coding at this abstraction there, mm -hmm. uh, not that uh, practical, right? You see what I'm saying? I just want to hear your comment. It's how do you look at it? See, because you want your system to be used. Our right? system is perfect. That's no bugs. <laughs> Sorry, no. Uh, that is a good question. What we well, because a lot of the mechanisms have a lot of reuse, and we've, we've tried to go down all the code path, and we've tried to make sure that the obvious bugs are not there. Um, there may be some subtle bugs which we might have missed, which are specific to your system. Um, any language. You could do that against an operating system, too. You know, it has bugs. And so, but what I can say, we, we are trying to the next step was maybe having a verification or a model checking system for your implementation and also of our, and of our runtime. So if there are bugs, you can actually figure out if it's in the, imp, in the policy or in our, or in our uh, code base. Yeah, but, but this is different from library. Mm -hmm. I guess the real question is, who's your target user? 
who do want the system? To researchers, mostly, I think, for right now, because it's our prototype. But the thing is, it's not necessarily who uses this prototype. It's also how you think about designing a system, and that's general. Um, you know, if you're, as a, now if I had to build a system from scratch, I would think about it in policy and in terms of blocking. I wouldn't go down and think about, all right, what am I supposed to send through each other? It's the, we offered you a way to approach this problem of building a new system, which I think is general. Yes. So is there a lessons learned slide here? So you built 12 systems, you looked at different policies. So mm -hmm. Obvious or non-obvious, so is there a set of things that you came up with on these are the right things to do? And that could help alleviate, answer some of the problems on what is the right way to doing it? Are there bugs in there which manifest themselves and I'm unable to see? So is there some story around that? Um, the story was... I mean, ideally, I would have liked to see, I, I'm not asking as hard a question as Doug did at the metal level, but at yeah. least some new system. So it's great that we looked at existing systems. Mm -hmm. So. Which of the three directions of the forks did we go with? Did we find bugs in the existing systems? Did we improve the performance of the existing systems? Or did we make it fundamentally easy to build new systems? So trying to answer some of those. So. so the thing is, we don't have the code of the existing systems. And what we're doing is we're just implementing our own, I mean, our version of the system over the policy. Um, the lessons learned, I can, I can tell you a little like, anecdote about how the system came about. Um, and how we actually, I mean, the final poll, the final API you see is really simple, but that wasn't a, a case first. So when we first started, we actually had the mechanisms layer. The Practi was already ready, and it had 50 or 60 method calls. And it just that you just call that to implement a system. And it was very difficult to build with it. Um, then we realized that, all right, maybe one part of it is routing. And so we took Overlog and we plugged it in. And we realized that we could do a bunch of stuff but we couldn't do consistency yet. And then we added consistency, the blocking to it. And we thought they'd be separate, and we realized, wait, that doesn't work. They need to communicate with each other for, uh, for some cases of consistency. And also, again, for Pangea, the case, we had to add a way for the routing to talk to the local storage. And, but while, so we started you know, incrementally adding all these different features and we cut down on the API size. We realized we don't need all this API, all the 40 stuff, let's just cut it down. And eventually we came to this neat little abstraction. Uh, the difficult part in building each of these systems were actually having to look at their, as you mentioned, looking at their systems and no one understands what they're doing and converting them into subscriptions or converting them into our primitives. Do you have a question? Yeah, since we're telling anecdotes then, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So um, I'm going to make a claim. I'm just curious to see if you believe my claim. Okay. Uh, I'm going to claim that in most complex systems out there, that production systems, probably not research systems, mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, 10% you know, of the code, 10% of the effort is put into implementing basically 90% of the functionality. Yeah. And the other 90% of the code is implemented to deal with the 10% of the corner cases, weird mm -hmm. things, you know, sort yeah. of like. Do you believe with that? Do you believe that statement? For production systems? Or, I mean, in general, I believe that in general, too. So uh, in, in for system? everything, you know. Work solving the 10% so part of the of building systems? Maybe, yes. But it's an important 10%. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, the problem is, with, if you don't have that 10, if that 10% is not right, your 90% is wasted. Absolutely. So, you know. So I really like your answer to the, what's the target audience for this thing, is that, in that research. I think this is great for research, but I absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Can you take a subset of the, the protocol space and prove that your mechanisms are fully general for that subset? Take a subset of a protocol. What you mean for synchronization protocol and prove that? I mean for the file system protocol. For, or you may call it the policy space. Okay. And I wouldn't ask for the whole possible space because I don't really know. <coughs> you found the space in such a way mm -hmm. that you say I'm only going to allow two copies of any file. I'm only going to allow blocking in these cases. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to restrict my topology to fully connected networks. Okay. And could you then prove that your mechanisms are <coughs> enunciated 
you could express all possible protocols in that space. You can. Because you're talking you about can, model checking and yes. making claims about generality, and so mm -hmm. if you start going in that direction, it seems like it it, is, it may be possible. I think so. Yes, I think you can. I think Have our. Tried to do that? No, we haven't. Okay. Yes. So you, you observe this huge design space of distributed file systems, uh -huh. and consistency, and safety policies. A after doing this work, did you did you suddenly realize, look, there's this, there's this great part of the design space that we're missing, and now they have this policy engine I can implement it. Do you have thoughts about the coverage of the design space of, ex of these existing 20 years of distributed file systems that you implemented, or do you feel like do you feel like just finished? Yeah, are we are we done? I mean, <laughs> yeah. but, no, but what, what, so so now you. you Examine all this so deeply. You know, mm -hmm. what, 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 what have you? What are your thoughts about this space and how well it's covered? And, and have you have you started thinking about where you're going to go? go with yeah. What 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 is your conclusion? Your direction? To my future directions. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, you knew what I was going to say. Just future research ideas, but something about the policies. <laughs> So I, I do think that uh, in this whole scenario, I mean, the systems, we're not quite done yet. Um, there are, I think there is now a need for adapting. So they, they, there are certain points, they have certain fixed consistency semantics or fixed way of propagation. I think the next part is being able to adapt uh, to different uh, workloads or scenarios, like uh, in real time. So, for example, you know, and um, that part, having adaptive policy has not been looked at yet. And that is where my future directions come in. I want people to actually be able to access your data from anywhere and, you know, and any device and without having your data get lost. It's surprising, like, even now, like, there's some scenarios which I would love to have, which we don't. For example, if I'm walking down the street, and I see this flower, I love this photo, I, I love it, and I take my phone and I take a picture, and I want that data to be automatically transferred to maybe my laptop at home, uploaded on my Flickr, uh, backed up somewhere so you know, it doesn't get lost. And we have bits and pieces of it, but there's no way to do it right now, or, or easy way to do it. Or also, for example, if I'm traveling in a, in a developing country and I'm in a youth hostel and I write a blog and I don't have internet connection and I meet another, per, another person in the hostel who's going to be going home, being able to just say, all right, can I transfer some of my data to your machine and if you're going have internet access, can you upload? it will automatically be uploaded to my servers and maybe sent to my home as well where it will be backed up. You know, having this seamless environment of being able to access your own data it's, it is a big vision, which we, I would want to achieve, but maybe I'll try and make smaller steps towards it. And the first thing is having an adaptive policy, is whether, how it, whether it can detect what, uh, adapting to network environments, adapting to maybe my mobile energy requirements, uh, if I'm synchronizing with the cloud, adapting to the cost models, you know, and having a simple, seamless interface between all my devices and the cloud. It also brings some networking issues and some security and sharing issues, which I'd like to explore. Um, yep, and that's what my talk, and I guess we can continue with the questions and anecdotes. More questions? I, I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned that you found Did you find that there were any downsides to using a declarative language? It was difficult to learn in the beginning. Uh, being able to think, like you read from right to left, uh, and they were being, that was difficult, being able to, it doesn't have, what I like about imperative is you have method calls, so you know this, ch this chunk of code is doing uh, this thing, whereas in Decoder it's all rules, and you don't know, when you have a bunch of code, when one event is fired, a rule may be fired up there or up there, depending on how you've written your code. So just iterating through how things actually run was a little difficult initially. And uh, making sure, trying to think about which rules should be run atomically 
like these rules should be fired at the same time before any rules or any, anything else are done. Uh, but that's an inherent of declarative language, but over time it gets easier. And uh, it eventually, once we built two or three systems, it was just much more easy to build in declarative than imperative because we could just copy and paste the rules and we knew they would work. So, well, following up on that, mm -hmm. do you think that the debugging effort per line of code, per declarative code, is higher, lower, or about the same as the, declarative, as the debugging effort per line of imperative code? Now that you're familiar per, with per line of so well, like per, you, per, you say, per rule does a lot of things. Well, that's, for, that's my point. Uh, you said you said look, we've only got a few rules here. This is great. Yeah. On the other hand, if it takes ten times as much effort to debug each one, then it's not as much of a savings as it otherwise seems. I don't. I don't. I think it's if you take a whole program, like a whole uh, instead of comparing per line, I'd compare maybe some two things which are doing the same thing. Okay. Um, that might be because uh, it's so much more concise. I think it's the same or maybe perhaps less in declarative once you're familiar with it. So more, more specifically, one of the, when, when mm -hmm. with your response about the, you know, the problems with making things run atomically, imperative languages have a kind of an yeah. easy answer for that. It's just you embed those function calls into the containing function. Mm -hmm. And the question of, and, and so I, I'd be curious what advantage you saw from having this layer of indirection by going and modifying data and having the change to the data trigger events. What, why was that a kind of a, a fundamentally helpful primitive here as opposed to then, or as opposed to just making <coughs> methods fall from within methods? Making, okay. Nested function calls. Nested right? function calls. My uh, function calls other functions. Um, we had, um, so the atomic one was actually just, uh, as a side note, it's just a matter of, it's, it, was a feature, it was a feature lacking in overlog, which we added in roverlog. That's why we changed that. Um, but we, had, we also have a Java interface for this, which we could program it. So you know, you're writing imperative language. Um, it was easier to do declarative because we could actually see what's happening in the whole system at, in, in, in a bird's eye view instead of looking through each code. And so when I, you know, one of our main concerns was, are we, is our system, what we're implementing, is that really close to the original system? And having a whole system, so when I implemented, let's say, tier store, and I went to Mike Deline and told him, this is what I think tier store should look like. It, it should be, and he's like, wait, you know, this doesn't, why is it this way, why is it that way? And it was just easy to review your whole code, your whole system, and make sure that it's actually following what your design is. So it's the conciseness benefit. Yeah. What is the, what is the language feature in, the imperative, in an imperative language that gets in the way of having similar kind of conciseness? It just takes too long, to, the number of lines of codes it takes. Because a similar code, if, you, if I was to implement this in imperative language, it might take me 1,000 or 2,000 lines, uh, maybe 1,000 lines of code. But wouldn't you modularize them? I mean, you have sub-functions, and so at you the would. top level, it, would, mm -hmm. it could be pretty Sorry, I have an allergy yeah. to declarative languages. I'm wondering. <laughs> I, mean, I actually I'm find them great. If, if I suppose that I, I had this severe allergy, and I wanted to take your uh -huh. principle of policies and mechanisms, could I do that in an imperative way? Mm -hmm. right. Or you could get shots. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so with respect to your future works, and may you mm -hmm. kind of envision this world where everything is being shared on everything, and it's not being shared on everything. I guess some things are being shared on some things. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happening now. I mean, I would want to have. I mean, as a user, I would want to have control where my data is going. Sure. Well, yes. Suffice it to say that the degree of shareitude, if I may call it, <laughs> is higher in this world. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what's the pricing model for that? Right, what's the, because I'm wondering, so like in your example, like a youth hostel, so you know, we meet at a youth hostel, I'm like, yeah, sure, I'd love to upload the picture of the flower you took on my phone, but am I paying for that? I mean, if you sent me like an eight meg picture of a flower, yeah, and, and you're I'm being charged by the bit, all of a sudden, maybe this is a bad hostel experience. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of, so at the research level, it's kind of cool to have, yeah. you know, some things being shared with some things, mm -hmm. but how do you, commit, you know, what, what's the user's uh, impetus to opt into this potentially very costly sharing arrangement. Have you thought about that at all? So, 
An advantage could be I could give you some money in return or promise you to give you dinner. Well, you know, if, if you know, uh, I haven't really. I mean, that the cost model is. It's highly subjective. I mean, in some sense, uh, you don't know. It depends on your network. Depends where you are. It could be that your internet is free, and so even sharing doesn't happen automatically. You have to allow it. So I'm hoping that if you if you you know you have to pay for your bits, you would ask me for dinner to help you share your photo. Okay. Yeah. back to your future work. Uh -huh. This is really an unfair question. So, you All right. Know. So, you know, Mike and Lorenzo started this project called COPE a bunch of years ago. Yes. Where they were looking at, at trying to make your all of your management of your personal devices and data mm -hmm. uh, zero overhead. Yeah. And the project really didn't go very far. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, you know, with your vision, what what has changed or why will it work this time? Um, <coughs> over, that, you know, over why that pro that project seemed to be too hard, or maybe wasn't ready, or the infrastructure wasn't ready. I think that that's what I want to say. We have pads now, and that solves everything. Uh, no, I mean the thing is, we actually do have an infrastructure now. It separates your implementation from policy, and now all you need to focus on how to get the policy right, and having to do adaptation in the policy level without having to worry about the mechanism. And so, so, so do you think that, that it wasn't possible to implement that vision before because you'd have to write too much code because you didn't have pads? Yes. That's pretty bold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's what we like in our work. <laughs> 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 I didn't say that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. So what is the main takeaway after looking at those 12 systems? Can I go with and Nugget saying we were doing a bad job initially and we'll do a better job now. No, if you I look at the end-to-end -end goal of delivering good performance, realizing a system, deploying it, and letting people use it. So what, what should I take away after? So after that? take away for this is everything can be separated into routing and blocking. I agree, but that's it. Is there and <laughs> Sorry? What, what does it buy, so what? apart from ease of code? So does it improve? Does it let me build new systems? I haven't seen that. Does it improve the performance of existing systems? Because now I have more time at my hand to spend. So what you can do, it actually does, I'm hoping like with this experience, it will prove to you that building new systems would be a piece of cake uh, in blocking so and routing. And what I'm trying to say is that, it, can you say that we were doing a bad job earlier? So are there examples to show that? The, I agree we spent the, a lot of time. There are hundreds and thousands of lines of code which we spent in our previous years but do they for the 20 systems <laughs> were a bad idea. Sorry? But do they work or are they broken, which you found out while? The systems we built were, we actually did testing on them in which we did all the failure models. Like, so if it's a client server, we failed. I mean, we got the client to, the server died and the client could recover. So they work. It doesn't not buy you anything. Uh, they're, they're fully functioning systems. And so instead of all, what, I, what it buys you is instead of spending a thousand lines of code or years of effort, you do it in a hundred lines of code. So, so maybe I can ask a question that you're too polite to ask. Yeah. Which is, if you if you're, if you build this framework, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always really scared when I when I read a paper where the authors construct this great model that, that allows you to do research, and then they don't use it to do anything, and then they then they toss it over the and wall and hope that somebody will pick it up and run with mm -hmm. it, because no one understands the model better than they do. Yeah. And if it's really a productivity enhancer, then you know they could get. Productivity yes. and and, uh, mm -hmm. and so you know have they, you they have like the access personal data anywhere. Yeah, that's right. So, so, <laughs> yes, so that's your, the next your, your talk is a slam dunk if you say. And by the way, all of these protocols are benighted, and 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 we've created this Uber protocol. So I guess the question is, why didn't you take it that next step and and create a better policy since it's so easy to do now in your environment? This is just you, you just didn't three, have time. Did. The, the, the three with the asterisks were new policies. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, were they, were they, but were they fundamental improvements? Were they tweaks? I mean, that's. Yeah. Well, I would, if they improve your performance in certain scenarios, I mean, in, in scenarios which you need performance improvement, I would consider them not tweaks, but fundamental improvements. They help you go into a different area of the design space. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
Okay. So, I think. so with your asterisks, how much did you improve those those systems? So, for example, for Bayou, if you were just interested in 10% of the data that's stored on the server, you only get 10% of your network uh, bandwidth is reduced by 90%. Uh, in Coda, uh, if your latency to your peer is 10 times, I mean, if you, you're, ten, you're connecting to your peers 10 times faster than connecting to the server, you get your data 10 times faster. Your read latency is improved. Okay, great. So, thank everyone for helping me answer the question. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> we should probably wrap at this point. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.